Um, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, with the number of people we have on today, um, I think it would be great if, if one, we can all be muted, but two, if we could turn off um, video as well. Um, that I think will hopefully help the um, online clarity. And if we put questions in the chat function of Zoom, um, I'll endeavour to ask, answer as many questions as I can at the end of the little PowerPoint presentation. And any that don't get answered at that stage, um, we'll um, try and answer in the frequently asked questions section of the guidance. And just one thing to, I'd like to check in before we get started. If you're not your school's EOTC um, coordinator and you've come to this Zoom through a different um, pathway, um, it would be great if you could check in your school that your EOTC coordinator is registered on the database. And getting them registered is as easy as finding this button on the EONS's website. Um, so that would be very useful going forward. Now that you've been back at uh, school for a oh, and one other thing I should say, we are recording um, this Zoom so that we can share it with those that couldn't be here today. We've had a few apologies and um, a number of people um, ask that we can do that. So um, it will be recorded um, and made freely available um, for those that can't be here. Uh, so now that you've been back at school for um, into our second week now, um, you'll be well aware of your school's um, safety management and how they have embedded um, the public health requirements for Alert Level 2 into that overarching health and safety. And within that, the key controls that you're using to manage um, COVID-19 in your school, as they are in all workplaces, um, around ensuring sick people stay away, um, the physical distancing requirements for you at school, and the good hygiene practices for school and the contact tracing of people entering your school. So what we're going to look at today and then answer questions about is what these things look like in an EOTC or outdoor ed context. And I'll just expand a little bit on some examples out of the guidance and then um, try and leave lots of time at the end to answer questions that are going into the chat function of this Zoom. So uh, around those that are unwell, staying at home, um, you'll know the symptoms because you need to check um, when they're coming into your class. Um, but also having a, that step in there so you have time to check before you leave on your EOTC event. And then be prepared and have a plan for if someone um, does come and present as unwell as you're getting on the bus, what you're going to do with that student. So being prepared to leave them and where you're going to send them so that your trip can get away on time. Um, also having a plan in place if someone reports as unwell during the event. Um, and that's looking at things like um, how would you be able to isolate them? Um, who would supervise that student? And is it practical for a parent to come and pick them up from the trip? Or is there some other procedure you need to put in place? to allow that to happen. Uh, physical distancing, um, same as you're um, working with at school. Um, and basically you take your school students with you and you take the physical distancing rules that you're working with at school with you. Um, where that uh, physical distancing, why well, not breathing on each other, isn't practical or possible, then it's that emphasis as it is at school on um, hygiene and when you're going on a trip thinking about what you need as far as hygiene um, products sanitizers wipes etc um, and making sure you have those with you uh, you also need to think about the two mem two meters from members of the public um, and you might need to put some um, particular thought into that if you're going to places that have narrow trails or entrances into buildings, um, stepping off a bus onto a street. Uh, and it might be as simple as just talking to your students and having a plan in place to wait until there's, there's room to go. Around good hygiene, same thing again. All of these things, the same as you would be doing in school. 
where you need to think a little bit um, more is around that regular cleaning of commonly touched surfaces and what these could be on your event. Um, things like the minivan um, door handle, uh, doors that you have to open or close um, for your event, um, gates, and whether either sanitizing is an option um, of the thing, or whether uh, having one person hold open the gate while the whole class goes through and then one person close it, sanitize their hands before and after, is a more practical solution. Um, things like doors, can you just pin them back and leave them open so you take out that um, risk altogether? Uh, contact tracing, same as a school, uh, you'll be recording who's on the trip anyway, so that's um, really normal practice. Uh, maybe a little bit more detail is needed around uh, where and when you're at that particular place on your trip and who the group comes into contact with. Uh, so if you're getting a talk from a park ranger down at the local park, you would want to capture their details and um, two contact, uh, two, two methods of contact, phone number and uh, email, for example, um, for those people that you come in contact with while you're out and about. Uh, same applies with um, parents or volunteers, just make sure they're on your contact list. Um, around equipment, um, the emphasis here is on hand washing and drying or sanitizing, making sure um, that you have those uh, supplies with you uh, if you're using equipment off site, and then considering how you're hand, uh, disinfecting. So, um, wet items, immersion, dry items, spray and leave, being careful with the use of cloths and paper towels that you're not. Um, using them in a way that actually spreads rather than um, disinfects. Yeah, so just thinking about where it's practical um, to do that and also where it isn't practical to do that. So for examples like rock climbing holds and ropes, um, it's really not practical to be sanitizing those between uses. So concentrating in those um, circumstances on cleaning the participant rather than the gear. You know, sanitizing hands before and after use um, and concentrating on that. Uh, there's been lots of questions on what regular cleaning means in this space and ideally it would be between groups of users, so if you're in a school setting it'd be between classes. Um, again, not always practical. I think a minimum standard would be um, once a day but again, if you can't clean the, if it's not practical to clean the gear, then concentrating on um, really emphasizing the hand washing and drying and sanitizing. Um, around consideration of what activities you might be doing, um, thinking carefully when there's um, a high degree of physical contact required, and particularly around um, things where you actually have to be really in that um, very close uh, face zone. So for example, um, kayak, teaching um, kayak rolling uh, might be one example there, where um, it actually, is it something that can be shifted to a different time or is there another way of achieving the same outcome? Um, if the answer is no, then it's what can you put into place? Um, to minimise that risk. And again, coming back to um, making sure your um, students and you are really well before the activity and really following good hygiene practices. Um, volunteers, um, really they're fine to use and um, whether they're volunteers or parents, it's around checking their well before, making sure they're contact traceable, and then being very clear about their role in the event so that they know what they're there to do and they um, understand all of your COVID systems that you have in place. Again, in your contract system tracing, you need to uh, make sure you've got that, those two points of contact for them.
um, transportation. Um, this just uh, mirrors what is happening for school buses. So um, recording um, each vehicle that is used, the students and staff that travel in it to enable that contact tracing. Um, trying to avoid students swapping vehicles if you're going on we a checked and it was working fine. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to leave the meeting for a minute. You can go back in again. We can hear you. Um, and having sanitize, hand sanitizer, um, as the school bus system does for students to use before and after. Um, sanitizing vehicles around the high touch points, really. Um, and again, being practical about how that looks. Uh, working with external providers, the really key factor here is that you're having, um, working closely with them, having robust conversations around um, ensuring that you're agreeing on your health and safety plan. They, they will have really good systems in place and it's that conversation between you and the external provider that's really important. So you both understand uh, what those systems are and how they will work. You can use Form 6 um, out of the EOTC uh, toolkit um, to guide those discussions with your provider and also um, this Level 2 guidance as well um, to help guide what you need to talk to them about. Uh, on our website, finding these things, so this is the EONS website, if you go to resources and publication, there's a drop down menu. Oh, but before we go to the next slide, here's the EOTC coordinator database button. Um, so you push that and you can register as an EOTC data uh, on the EOTC database. Up in here, there's a drop down button. If, if you go to EOTC management in that drop down, um, this is the page you find, and down here is where you can find. Um, Form 6, plus all the other EOTC safety management template and toolkit forms, um, plus lots of other stuff. And again, from that resources page, um, in the drop down, you can find the EOTC learning through COVID-19 alerts. That's where this guidance sits, down in here. Um, and as it's updated with more frequently asked questions, this date up here will change as well. Further down on this page, there's lots and lots of resources uh, to support EOTC um, in the current environment. Um, so now um, Catherine's gonna read out um, some questions um, that hopefully I'll be able to answer. Um, if your question doesn't come up, or you think of something later, this email address here um, comes straight to me and I'm happy to answer questions um, at any time. And you might find them pop up on a frequently asked question at the bottom of the guidance as well. Right, so the first question uh, was from Gary. How often during an event should we clean services and ha hand sanitize? Um, Really, it's trying to work out um, what's practical um, and, and achievable. Uh, between groups is ideal. Uh, if that's not practical, uh, once a day, I think, would be considered a, a minimum. But again, it might be something that it's not practical to clean in the first place, like climbing holds, where you then concentrate on cleaning the participant. So... Sanitise before and after, clean the participant. Okay, next question. What is your advice, this is from Craig, what is your advice about booking facilities in the future? My school's leadership team is nervous about booking for camps in November, but we need that much time to book and organise. Yeah. Um, from what I hear around, those um, places could be under pressure at the end of the year. So I think um, booking as soon as you can. Um, they're all working out their systems um, as we speak and they're, um, they're ready to go. 
So there's nothing to stop you booking now. Um, and hopefully this guidance can reassure um, board members and senior leadership team that um, there is good systems and you've got a robust health and safety system that can back you up and going to those places. From Kate, if we have a rehearsal at school, does a teacher need to physically stay in the room at all times to supervise students so, that, so they don't break physical distancing rules, etc.? So that's a rehearsal at school. Cool. Uh, that would really, Kate, depend on your school's um, systems for managing that. Um, that supervision um, is probably a school decision. From Craig, another Craig. Craig, uh, uh, my board and CEO were also nervous about our two, two school camps at Hillary and Boyle in October. However, they have signed off the MOUs with the understanding that if alert levels go up again, we can cancel the event and just lose the jobs. All right, so that's more in, um, kind of links to that other question. Yeah. Not so much. Not so much a question. From David, we are trying to make sure our camp goes ahead. At what point does camp get cancelled in terms of levels? I think camp became impossible at level four and level three, you would put it in um, that category as well. Definitely level two, um, camps are perfectly manageable. Um, and the external providers will have all of those systems in place and you need just a robust discussion with those providers to make sure um, you understand what they've got in place and it meets your expectations. So that, um, Cathy um, asks, is the message then that we can go ahead with overnight trips in level two? Correct, yep. Overnight trips in level two are good. Go. And the next question then, so we have a ski camp in August. There is nothing saying that we can't go if we follow the appropriate guidelines that we have in, in place currently. Is that correct? Yep, that is correct. Uh, ski, ski fields are open. They're um, well, going to be open when the snow arrives. Um, they'll be managing public physical distancing um, and you manage your school group within that. So from Alicia, if a participant were to become unwell on a multi-day trip, would you recommend that the trip ends for everyone involved, i.e. a multi-day tramp, and all return home to self-isolate, or would it be sufficient to send the unwell person home, or is that um, each school's decision? Uh, there's a number of answers in there. Um, in level two, it is so unlikely that the illness is COVID-19 um, that isolating that one student um, is the right way to go and managing that one student. On a multi-day tramp, that might look like, um, can you um, sort of partition off a small part of the hut? Or, I mean, if you're in tents, they'll be in a tent by themselves at anyway at level two uh, and then um, can you have or do you have the um, facility to get that student um, back to a road end and get their um, parents to come and pick them up um, you kind of need to think around your supervision structure uh, but it's very like if you had a case of um, vomit the vomiting bug on an overnight or multi-day tramp I mean, how would you deal with that? So you can, could just put it in that basket as well. But if you could deal with taking that student um, out by themselves with a staff member or with two students, um, probably to manage um, your child protection policy um, and getting them back to their parents, um, that would be one way of doing it. Okay. From Andy, do you regard a fly the same as a tent? One person per tent is in the guidelines, but there is much more ventilation in a fly. We are thinking of using 
two per fly as it seems excessive to carry one fly per person. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be some very strong outdoor ed kids out there at the end of level two, packing their individual tents. Uh, I think um, the reason tents were one per person was the a prolonged um, exposure in a closed environment. So flies, as Andy says, um, you've got a whole different category of ventilation. You, the other mitigating um, factor that you could have in a tent, in a fly situation is having um, top and tail. Um, and you've got um, two entrances, like if you had two entrances, they go separate ways out of the tent or out of the fly, um, I think that would meet the requirement of not being in each other's faces and breathing each other's ear. From Lynette, uh, physical distances on buses, question mark? So the um, physical distancing on buses and minivans is exactly the same um, recommendations as school um, transport is running. So um, my understanding, if you're using a commercial bus driver, they're leaving the seats behind the bus driver empty. Um, if you're a staff member, um, you don't need to uh, necessarily do that. Um, and that's really the end of physical distancing. Um, so you can have the legal limit of um, students in the minivan um, and a driver or in the bus. Okay. If you're using, I should say, if you're using a commercial transport provider, they will have um, their requirements as well, which is probably leaving those seats empty behind their driver. Next question, has the cap of 10 for bookable dock accommodation gone, uh, gone up now with yesterday's announcement? That was from Will. Yeah, it hasn't changed on their website yet. But my conversation with the person that wrote the DOC guidelines was that it would shift um, as soon as that 10 shifted. Um, it, they are thinking that in level two, it will only shift to half the capacity of the hut because they're dealing with public and that, um, that two metre rule. So um, yeah, they'll, they'll go to half the capacity of the hut bookable or not. Um, I, might, I should have said earlier, for the people that have asked those questions, if, if the question hasn't been answered, if you could uh, find your raise hand button and, and raise your hand, it pushes you to the top of my list and then I can give you, um, um, and, then, and then, well, it just can create a, a a conversation you can unmute and 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 clarify um, what your question um, or how, how how well that answered your question Good point. Um, so from Ruth in, uh, in level two of camping um, is it advised that there is only one student per tent I think that might have been covered Fiona yes the I mean if it's a giant tent you know use your um, judgment on that um, but that advice is definitely around your classic um, tents that you'd be using in outdoor education or in school camps where you might be putting um, two, three, four people in a tent. Um, if it was a big scout-like square tent that you could um, safely get a good metre or two apart, then yeah, you could reconsider that. With all of these things, of course, um, they all go back to it being your school. The final decision is always with your school. So um, you can use your own thought process as well um, if you think that uh, what you're talking about isn't really what the guidelines is talking about, if that makes sense. And so bunk rooms are okay, Fiona? That's a question. Yep, bunk rooms are fine. The consideration that might need to be given to bunk rooms is where they have the big bench um, sleeping platforms. Uh, quite common in dock huts. 
um, and also in some providers um, will have a big sleeping platform. Where that's the case, um, you probably want to leave, I mean, half the number of people that might be normally on that sleeping platform. Uh, you could put in um, the same as with a fly, think about um, top and tailing. The providers will be, have worked through how that looks for them as well, because they also have responsibilities um, about keeping you safe in their place. Um, so they will probably have already set up how they think their bunk rooms should work. Um, the other key thing and that they will be doing is keeping a note of what students are in what bunk rooms um, so that they can um, have some really good contact tracing there. And also just re-emphasizing the importance of um, hygiene within bunk rooms. So um, probably a good idea would be sanitizing on your, your hands on your way into the bunk room. A little protocol around if you know you're going to have a big coughing fit, leave the bunk room and go outside. Those types of things can be put into place. Okay. From Lynn, what would be best practice for food preparation and meals on camp? So there is some really good guidance out of MB. Um, there's a direct link in the EOTC guideline um, and that really is the link to, um, to click on and follow because that will change. So it's best to check exactly um, what the expectations are straight from the source before you go. Same thing if you're going to a provider, they will be doing that as well. And in your conversation, just check with them. Um, uh, you know, what did you, what guidance have you put in place from MB and how will your kitchen work and, and how will food work on this camp? Okay, that's it for questions at the moment. Oh, one question, what is MB, please? Oh, the Ministry of uh, Business, Innovation and Employment. Um, the link is uh, in that guidance under, oh, under working with external providers on page three of the EON's guidance. There's a direct link um, that will take you straight into there. And actually, it's not MB guidance, my apologies. It's the Ministry of Primary Industries, MPI. Has anyone got questions they'd like to unmute for? Thanks, Fiona. Um, just, just want to clarify, please. Um, it's definitely primary industries that we look at to ascertain what food hygiene we should be following. Yes, yeah, so if you go to page three of the... EOTC and Outdoor Ed at Alert Level 2 guidance. Um, there's a direct link there um, in the document. And that, that guidance is on uh, the reopening of food businesses. Thank you. Um, and also that will get updated. So it's always good to check at the source for those things. Great, and um, from that wasn't from that was that wasn't Gary. Did Gary have a question? Yes, I have a question. Um, it's Gary from Fungal College calling. I just say, I'm just wondering um, when this first was announced about the EOTC and outdoor education. Is there any separate rules or guidelines for EOTC that's not for outdoor education? Because we consider outdoor education as part of our whole EOTC program. Yeah. Is there any reason why it's been separated? No, and in fact, it's not really separated. Some schools um, 
do treat them a little bit differently. So we were trying to make sure that people realised that this guidance was for both things. Okay, thank you. So it's just in the heading. Um, and another question, I'm not sure if, or I haven't answered it today, Gary, but around sports trainings and sports competitions. Um, so this yes. guide doesn't cover um, sport and sports trainings and competitions. Um, the Sporting Z advice um, should be followed for those things. And, and that is just, um, will be right in the process of being changed, I imagine. Um, after right. yesterday's expansion of the numbers. Uh, so again, in, our, um, in the EOTC and Outdoor Ed guidance, there's a link to Sport NZ that takes you directly to their COVID page. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, and Craig, um, go for it, if, um, Craig Smith. Hi, Fiona. Uh, it's Craig here from Tardio High School. Okay. I just wanted uh, a point of clarification here because we've uh, run into a bit of trouble with some of our PE classes going off site. Now, I'll give you an example here. We wanted to take some of the PE classes off site to do some training uh, for a cross country type run. Yep. And as part of that, we had to book the space through the Napier City Council. Napier is where I'm based. And yep. Uh, because it, it was a cl classes of 30, they would not accept the booking. Mm -hmm. yep. So what what is the word on that? Is that if we have to follow what they say or is that we are a school, even when we go off the school grounds into the community, we're exempt from those regulations? Yeah, it's a difficult space for councils and this isn't the first council um, that has um, proven to be a little bit of a barrier. Uh, yeah, outdoor providers are one thing, they really understand the school space. Um, but when you're dealing into a council with um, some really strict um, interpretations of how it is, yeah, it's a, a challenge. Um, hopefully the change from 10, groups of 10 to 100 uh, will have solved that for your groups of 30, um, won't have solved it for your 100. Um, you could possibly send them this EOTC um, alert level guidance and see if that gets you anywhere. Okay. Can't right. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay. I've got a question from Will who's typed it up. What's the difference between sitting in a van for a few hours, traveling to a destination and sleeping next to each other in a tent? Same goes for sleeping in cl close proximity in a bunk room and a tent, still close to each other. Does it matter if we are already a school bubble? Uh, so in discussion with the tent space, it was around um, that ab absolutely you're, you're very close for at least eight hours. Well, actually it's not at least eight hours, depends how long you manage to keep them in the tent for but it is an extended period of time and it's a small space. And so there's no, um, there's not a lot of ventilation. So basically um, you're gonna get whatever the other person sleeping in there is. The risk in a bunk room is that um, you are at least a meter away. Um, most bunk rooms will be able to be managed so you're further away than that. Um, it's a compromise really. The, um, the Ministry of Ed just weren't happy with the, the tent concept of sharing and it being such a tight space, really. Um, hopefully we're not at level two for very long and um, flies are a good idea. How much tenting there is um, coming up in the South Island, we're probably just about over tenting season, at least. Any other questions at all?
Anything else from you, Catherine? Uh, not related to not to related to the, the topic per se, except that we do have a, um, and this is for any of you who have colleagues that actually weren't able to get into the meeting. We have a um, a plan for 500 participants, and it threw out um, a ceiling of 100 to people who were in the waiting room. So I've dealt with that um, as best I could, but we will be sending you a link um, to this conversation and to the PowerPoint. Oh, it'll, be, it'll all be in together. So you will have that information and I'll also send it to all of those who registered. So if you um, have that, um, if, you, if you know of somebody who had tried to get in and couldn't, then please uh, pass on um, our apologies. Yeah. And please, uh, feel free to utilise the EOTC support at eons.org.nz email address um, with any questions going forward. And when this advice changes um, down to level one, um, any questions then too. Yeah. I do have just one, one other, um, one other uh, uh, suggestion. For those of you who, who, um, who are EOTC coordinators, you get a, a network update periodically. And obviously that's, um, that's uh, how most of you also uh, got into this meeting. There is a, um, an EOTC update that is uh, um, uh, freely accessible to anybody who, who subscribes to that and that can happen off our homepage. And that has got a whole, carries a whole lot more information around teaching and learning as well for um, across the, the, the breadth of EOTC within schools. And so um, if, if you, you or your staff are not aware of that, then please do um, do just take a look on, on our homepage to scroll down a little bit. There's, um, I think the latest EOTC update is, is there to have a look at and you just um, leave your email address and your name and, and you get them delivered automatically. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much everyone for making the time um, and for being keen to get the students back out in the outdoors.